I'm Cecilia Martinez. Uh, this is Mobile Deployments for Web Developers. I am a developer advocate for AppFlow, the mobile CI CD platform built by Ionic. Uh, you can feel free to connect with me at Cecilia Creates on Twitter and GitHub or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Before joining Ionic, I've been at companies like Cypress and Replay, and I love helping developers solve problems. The problem that we're going to be talking about today are mobile deployments. Uh, so just out of curiosity, how many of you all have gone through the process of deploying a mobile app to the app stores? OK, cool. Couple hands. Good. So you may be wondering, why do I care about mobile as a web developer? Well, increasingly, we're seeing that users live on their mobile devices, right? Everything from paying bills, even telemedicine appointments, reaching out to friends and family, shopping, everything happens on a mobile device. So the more that you know about mobile devices and how users interact with them, the better that you can understand your user and how they may interact with your own apps as well. Additionally, we're seeing an uh, increase in the popularity of cross-platform development. So cross-platform means from a single code base deploying to iOS, Android, and even mobile web. So as a web developer, you may need to use your skills in order to build for a mobile device and then be able to actually deploy that. We're also seeing an increase in popularity of taking web content and using that for mobile applications. So again, you may end up having to do a mobile deployment, and the more that you can know about it before you get to that point, the better, because mobile deployments are very complex. They are very different from web. And the reason that is is ultimately because the platform that you're building for. When you're building for web, you're essentially building a web app, an app that's going to interact with another piece of software. It's interacting with a browser. So it's two pieces of software interacting. When you're building for mobile, you're building for hardware. You're actually compiling a native application, an executable binary that's going to be installed on a piece of hardware and need to interact with that. So, and if you're de developing cross-platform, you're doing that for iOS and for Android. So you need to consider the complexities and the intricacies of each individual platform. The other difference is that when you're developing a web app, you're working with mostly interpreted code. So it's more dynamic, and you're able to interact with that browser at runtime versus, again, a compiled binary that is going to be run and executed at a later time. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that when you're developing for mobile and deploying for mobile specifically, the platform sets the rules. Uh, you are at the mercy of what Apple and Google, or you know, Android and iOS, ask you to do when you're building and deploying your application. So understanding what those rules are as early and as often as possible can help to increase the velocity of your deployments. So I'm going to take a look at the differences between web and mobile across each of the stages of development. So we'll take a look at testing your app, building your app, shipping your app, and then even updating your app. All right, so we'll start with testing. Um, testing is very near and dear to my heart, and hopefully uh, for some of you out there as well. <laughs> um, but when you talk about testing for the web, typically you are testing in specific environments. It could be your development environment if you're testing locally, or you may have dedicated or even ephemeral testing and staging environments. Within these environments, you'll launch your app in a browser, you'll run automated tests, and ideally you have min minimal manual testing. Um, in fact, you probably have automated CI where your tests will run. If they all pass, you can integrate that new code into your application and deploy it. On the mobile side, you have to have a native build, that native binary, already compiled before you can test. So out of the gate, you already have a much more complex testing process. Once that native binary has been um, created, you can then install it on either virtual or real devices to test your application. This requires significant amount of manual testing. The vast majority of mobile developers will do manual testing. Even if they have some automation, ultimately they will be doing a lot of manual. And typically that manual testing happens over multiple rounds. So you will actually have to promote your application version, the version of your app, through multiple rounds of testing before it's ready for release. I mentioned devices. Uh, so you have virtual and real device options uh, for virtual op uh, devices, you have emulators for Android and simulators for iOS. 
There's a couple like technical specifications that make them different, but really what it is is a piece of software that's emulating a, a hardware device. Um, but ultimately, you can't really replicate those hardware um, interactions that you will have on a real device, so ultimately you will need to do real device testing. You can do this by either connecting a device to your dev machine, you can manually install the binary on developer devices, or you can upload your binary to what's called a real device farm. This allows you to access real devices in the cloud. So there's like AWS device farm, Sauce Labs browser stack, so you can actually run your application on a device that's not present in your location and run automated or manual tests. All right, so I mentioned that you do have to build the native binary in order to test it, so let's talk about the build process and how that's different between web and mobile. On the website, like, you don't actually technically need a build, right? This is a function of modern web development where we have frameworks and we use things like transpilers and bundlers to create optimized output of a production build, so to speak. If I wanted to, I could just write like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and then not even have a build step and put that, those files in the servers, right? But we don't do that anymore because we want to have a good developer experience so we want to have a performant web app, so we need to have a build step. But typically this is built in um, where we have like NPM run build, it takes all of our dependencies, it creates that optimized output, and because of this build step is typically pretty quick, we're able to create new builds pretty easily to update dynamically. Again, not so simple on the mobile side because we're actually doing a compilation process and there are infrastructure requirements for that compilation process to take place. And they're going to be different for Android and for iOS. For iOS, you do need Mac hardware in order to create a build. So this is already kind of like a gatekeeping function for developing for iOS. There's also gonna be specific build types for each platform. On Android, you have debug builds and release builds. Release builds are going to be the builds that are ready for the um, Google Play Store. On the iOS side, you have Simulator, you have Ad Hoc, you have App Store builds, and the App Store is what you're going to need in order to get into the App Stores. And so when you actually go to build your application, you need to specify which build type that you're going to create. But the biggest obstacle of all in the build process is definitely going to be code signing. So how many of y'all have had to deal with code signing before for mobile apps? Okay, and how many of you um, got it right the first time? That's right, no hands, okay, good. Um, so code signing is essentially a authentication process where you're using secure credentials to say, this bundle of my app, this native binary, was created by me, I am authorized to do that, these are the devices it can run on, and it has not been altered or modified since the time that it was created. These are requirements in, that are put in place for Android and iOS, like you cannot get around this process. For Android, it's required for any type of release build. For iOS, it's required for any build that actually will run on a real device. So for you, simulator builds, you don't need it, but for every single other type of build, even if you just wanna run it on like your own phone that you're connected, you need to have the go through the signing process. So these credentials that you use for code signing are secure, so they need to be generated securely, they need to be stored securely, they cannot be compromised, they cannot be checked into Git, and they have to be in the environment that you use to build. On the Android side, you have the upload key and the app signing key. On the iOS side, you have a signing certificate and a provisioning profile. So if you are looking to automate your process in CI CD, these need to be installed in your environment. All right, so you've built your app, you've tested it, you feel moderately confident that there's no bugs in it, and it's time to actually get it to your users. Um, the shipping process. On web, this is, you put the files in the server. That's how you ship to the web, right? I used to use FTP Zilla back in the day. I don't know if anybody else like, is old enough to remember that, yes. Um, where you just dragged, waited, refreshed, boom. Everybody has the same version, it's good to go. On mobile, you, again, are at the mercy of the platform. You have to go through the App Store approval process. So everybody who raised their hand earlier about going to the deployment process, how many of you were rejected by the Apple App Store? Yes, so the same people. So it's, it's a rite of passage. Everybody gets rejected because the application approval process is so complex. And so you have to 
get a sense of what are some of the reasons why people get um, rejected in order to make sure that you are actually able to release. You also need to set up your store listing with your details and your screenshots and set up your privacy and data agreements. Approval process can take up to a week or more. That's like a real quote. That's how they say, up to a week or more. Very scientific, really helps you uh, with your planning. And if you get rejected, you have to go through the resubmission process. So understanding some of those reasons why you could get rejected um, can really help you out here. So these are the most common reasons why apps get rejected by the Apple App Store. And so taking a look at these from the web, the lens of a web developer, crashes and bugs, broken links, placeholders or incomplete information, like 40% of web apps are now like rejected, right? <laughs> we keep going through privacy policy issues and unclear data access requests. Data access requests that refers to any time the app will ask for your location, access to your photos. Um, it has to be very clear why you're requesting that information. Substandard UI. We've now wiped out 80% of web apps. Like all of them are rejected. <laughs> So, but you can't have a substandard UI, and Apple even gives you screenshot examples of what it considers a substandard UI, and I'm pretty sure I have a GeoCities website out there that looks just like the example. Like, it's, it's uncanny. So you have to have an, a UI that meets their standards and looks like what they expect on their platform. Um, that's where something like a framework that's designed for mobile app development can be really helpful. Uh, static web content, a lot of the focus here is on the static aspect, not the web content aspect. You can't take, like, I couldn't take my blog and take that static web and then turn it into a native application and submit it to the Apple App Store. There needs to be a reason why it should exist as a native app with increased functionality or interaction, some reason, not just taking anything that's static and turning it into an app. And finally, not enough lasting value. If it's a uh, app that only exists for a very short period of time or only apply to a niche audience, it could be rejected. So once your app has actually been finally approved, you've gone through the process, you do have to be responsible for updating and maintaining that app. And your app will live, have, has a very long lifespan. And because of that, you need to think about your ongoing support. But let's start with web, right? When you update for web, you have total control over your releases. You decide what happens, when they go out, when you, what, what code changes are included in a release, and deployments are immediate. Again, you put the files in the server, and your user refreshes, and every, all the users have the same app version at the same time, barring any A-B testing or you know, feature flags. Every single user is going to have the exact same experience when they interact with your web app. This means that you can push critical bug fixes or updates as needed very easily and on your own terms. Because of the App Store approval process for mobile, updating your app becomes more complex and requires more of a strategic approach because you do have to go through App Store approval for each update. The other thing to think about is that not every user is going to be on the same version of your app. There is what's called the long tail of app versions that you have to support. So for example, like my mom doesn't know how to update an app on her phone. She's probably like on Dunkin' Donuts 1.0. <laughs> It, and she has no idea how to go to the App Store and click Update or turn on automatic updates. So if Dunkin' Donuts was to change its an API or its back end or like a microservice that it uses or a third party um, service that it uses, they need to make sure that my mom can still get her like coffee and donut, otherwise she's going to be very upset. And so you have to think about, will all my changes be uh, backwards compatible with any version that could be out there being used by your users? You also need to upkeep with store app store requirements. So again, platform sets the rules. Android and iOS will say, we need you to update to the latest version of the SDK, or there's a security vulnerability we've identified, or you know what? You can no longer access this type of data uh, without very more specific details. So you may be required to push an update even if you have no bugs, no new features that you want to release, just to comply with the requirements of the platform. And if you don't, then you can get delisted from the app stores. So ultimately, this makes bug fixes and updates really difficult to deploy. But one way to get around that is by using something called live updates. This is also called over-the-air updates. You may hear that term as well. If you're building a cross-platform or you have any kind of web content in your app, you can actually update that content without app store approval, without having to go through a new native version. So you can push changes to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You cannot do any native changes. But uh, depending on 
what type of framework that you're using to develop, there's various tools that are available that allow you to do this um, in order to better push out bug fixes and updates on your own terms. So there's a lot that goes into the mobile deployment process, and as you can see, it's pretty complex. So anywhere that you can start to integrate automation can make it easier for you. There's lots of benefits to automation. It allows you to reduce knowledge silos on your team. I've talked to a lot of teams where they have like 30 developers and one person is responsible for the deployments. And at that person, you know, you have a real bus problem at that point in terms of if somebody gets on a bus and decides never to come back, um, then you no longer are able to do your deployments. So by automating that process, everybody on the team is able to have better access and understanding what that looks like. It also allows for shared credentials management of those secure credentials, improved release velocity, and also visibility. You're able to see what triggered a build, what version of your code base was used for it, what environment variables were being used. So all of that gives you better insights into your build process. There's a variety of different tooling types available to integrate automation into your deployment process. These types of tooling will fall into typically three categories. The first is mobile platform specific, meaning iOS tools or Android tools. There's also framework-specific tools for things like React Native or Capacitor, or you can use a general mobile tool. These tools can also be integrated with either your existing CI CD. So if you're already using something like GitHub Actions or Jenkins or Circle CI, you can integrate with that existing platform, or you can use a platform that's very specific for mobile builds. If you decide to go the integration route, there's single function and multi-function tools. Single function just means that it does one thing. It uploads your app to the app stores, or it handles the builds, or it handles configuration. Uh, there's some examples of those on the screen there. Or you can use a multi-function tool, which will handle multiple functions. So Fastlane, for example, will do configuration, it'll do builds, it'll do uploads, or services like AppFlow, CodeMagic, BitRise have these cloud service CLIs and APIs. If you want something that's more mobile specific, you can actually get an out-of-the-box mobile platform. You typically include a graphical user interface that allows you to build out your workflows. It also has cloud credential management, build stack management, and environment management. Um, so everything happens in that platform instead of you having to configure it on your own. And again, these can be Android or iOS specific, framework specific, or multi-support. When you're deciding on your team which type of tools that you want to use, these are the things that you need to think about because there's not going to be one right answer for every single team. You need to consider the DevOps expertise on the team. I kind of use like the, um, I fly a lot, so the security questions where they're like, if you're in the safety row, are you willing and able to assist? Do you have somebody on your team who is willing and able to handle the deployments? You'll also want to think about any existing CI CD infrastructure and tooling that you have, if you'd like to re-leverage any of that. And then also what platforms that you support. So if you're going to be building for Android, iOS, and web, Oh, and also what dev frameworks are used on your, at your organization. Does it make sense to go with a single platform or a single framework tool or something that supports everything? If you have any additional questions um, about CI CD, we do have uh, this QR code on the screen uh, for solving mobile CI CD with AppFlow. That's a free uh, white paper that you can scan and download and learn more about how to automate your mobile deployment process. Thanks, everyone.